Okay, great. Looks like we're live. Awesome. Uh, sounds good. Well, I want to thank everyone, uh, you know, for being here today. Uh, you know, obviously it's been a great day and uh, we're excited to have a conversation around stack resiliency uh, to sort of wrap things up. Um, you know, so much has been shared throughout the day, you know, around data organizations and, and building these systems and pipelines. Uh, you know, however, you know, it all ends up being for naught uh, if these systems aren't resilient. Um, you know, we need to make sure to reduce time to uh, mean time to remediation. Uh, I think this is especially true as systems become more complex and, and more challenging to triage. Um, you know, the, the market and technologies are continuing to evolve uh, and become more sophisticated. Um, you know, data pipelines today uh, can have multiple moving parts, uh, you know, are often running in different systems. Uh, you know, different parts are possibly owned by different teams. Uh, you know, in short, um, complex, hard, you know, hard to track, diagnose, and tune end to end. Um, so, you know, throughout the day, we've obviously talked a lot through observability, you know, this gap between data stakeholders and data teams, uh, you know, regulation and compliance, scalability, um, you know, all with this undertone of how important data and data pipelines are uh, to high performing organizations. Um, so it does feel only right to, to sort of end the day uh, talking about post build, right? Uh, so now you have all these critical components in your business, uh, they're all in place. Um, so how do we keep them from breaking, right? Uh, and so we'll look to discuss in more detail and try to go beyond just maximizing availability uh, to better understand who's responsible, you know, what's communicated, when is that communicated, uh, and are there certain tools preferred um, to simplify this process? Um, so with that, uh, a quick intro on me. Uh, my name is Noah Carr. Uh, I'm a partner at Point72 Ventures. Uh, I run our enter enterprise investing practice. Uh, I focus primarily on uh, partnering with early stage founders uh, in enterprise infrastructure. So cybersecurity, dev tooling, uh, and of course, data infrastructure. Uh, I'm a big believer in the growing importance of data ops and uh, look forward to diving in on resiliency. Um, I'm also excited to be joined by, by two experts in the space who've spent a bunch of time here um, you know, to discuss the topic. Uh, first, uh, Karan uh, Heremov. Um, Karan is currently a data engineer uh, at EasyPost, uh, working on their insights team. Uh, he works cross-functionally with various business teams uh, to deliver data analytics uh, and different products, data products. Uh, prior to joining EasyPost, uh, he was at BioBots and, uh, and at Plaid for a bit. Um, I'm also happy to be joined by Prashant uh, Dubey. Uh, Prashant is currently a senior manager for big data services at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, he works across you know, architecture, infrastructure, data governance, uh, and quality for enterprises, uh, for their enterprise big data technologies. Um, and has built a flexible, secure data platform for advanced analytics uh, and exploration. Um, and I'm sure that they can fill in any other additional gaps as we dive into the questions. But, um, you know, Karan, maybe, maybe we start with you. You know, what, what are some critical data pipelines in your business and, and what challenges do you face uh, in running them? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Noah, for that intro, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, some some critical data pipelines that we have at EasyPost is as, as an API that provides uh, you know shipping and logistics services. We're kind of a two two sided marketplace, right? We've got our customers purchasing from us, but at the same time, we're kind of purchasing from carriers um, as well. So there's a lot of uh, you know financial analytics that have to occur. Um, between these various parties on a daily, monthly, weekly basis um, that basically processes the raw event stream uh, and, and, and purchase data coming in from our customers, uh, converts that into uh, different structured reporting for our, our, our third party uh, rate partners, as well as for our carrier partners that then generate financial invoices. So we process you know, millions and millions of transactions a day purely through this, this process. Um, that's kind of one of the bigger ones that we do on a daily basis. Uh, additionally, hourly, we run, you know, uh, actual, you know, payment log and, and, and what we call payment logs transactions. These are all our Stripe data incoming from 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 uh, transaction aggregation, along with where that money is actually being spent to and eventually going to revenue recognition. So those are sort of the two biggest pipelines we have sort of external facing carrier related reporting, very specifically related to, um, you know, what the spend is and then what our financial obligation might be. And then additionally, you know, looking at revenue recognition and revenue purposes. And then finally, we kind of have some, some third 
the sort of uh, third area, I guess, third realm of that that we've been starting to build out over the last year or two are now we're selling data products externally. So these are now actual an actual product that is our data. So what are the pipelines that go into that? What are the sort of uh, the, the statistical analyses that need to occur to make that product robust? It's kind of that third family, I guess you could call it. Got it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, obviously, incredibly critical to your business. Um, I guess today, like, like, what are those core challenges that you think about, um, you know, in, in running those data pipelines? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so accuracy is a big one, especially when we're talking about, you know, financial transactions. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we're not dropping transactions. We're not losing events. We're not duplicating events. We're not causing, uh, you know, event streams to, to have, uh, you know, incorrect data. And so there's a lot of validation that goes, you know, cross comparing sources to each other. Um, looking at, uh, you know, the, the, uh, drift, if you will, between different uh, the different metrics that we know should be within a certain range of each other. Um, those are sort of the big picture ones. As we've talked about more products around the data space as well, um, you know, we've, uh, we, we've started putting models into production. And so what are the challenges with that, right? Is making sure that, you know, as we upgrade those models, as we look at back testing those models, that we have a, a pipeline that we're, we're, we're pushing our best model forward to our customer, right? Um, so constantly evaluating that, having humans in the loop and that whole thing, as well as as much automated as possible is kind of another challenge there. Got it. Yeah, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we should definitely dive in a little bit more as we go along. Yeah. But, um, you know, Prashant, I want to jump over to you you know, maybe just, you know, addressing the same questions, you know, as you think about it, you know, what, what are the critical data pipelines and what are the challenges you're seeing? Definitely. Uh, glad to be here. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely the J and J business is we have a very diverse business as well. Right? So um, the technology, the platform that I run as a big data platform, we are running similarly diverse data pipeline. And some of the critical one that we run, which has a financial implication on the J and J that we do a lot of processing of, uh, adverse events. Um, we go to those adverse events from our patients or, or people that we process it. So the criticality is the highest LA. One of the biggest criticality that we have is that we have to ensure that any adverse event that happen, we process it and then we have to report by end of the day to the our governing body authorities, mm -hmm. right? So it's um, and we and that's that's like utmost important. And if we fail and if we backlog it, it's comes as a financial implication and, and the penalties and all that, right? So um, the whole process of the data pipeline is is very critical for us. Uh, and that's where I think the data ops is is required. I mean, for, um, I, I'm not on the business side, I'm on the infrastructure and the platform management side. So my role is to ensure that, that we meet that high SLA, uh, whatever needed from the infrastructure and platform perspective, making sure that um, as you saw, resiliency, right? Our server has to uptime is 99.999%, making sure that the servers are up, making sure that, that the platform that we are running, it, it's also on, on a, uh, uh, a, a very well-defined processes there so that we, we don't get a zero backlog on the data. So um, that's one of the examples. And we have a bunch of other critical workloads that are running on it. Um, we run a lot of clinical research, the therapeutic area, we have supply chain perspective, like we have to make sure that some of the pipeline has to complete it. If, if there is something slows down or it failure happens, we end up not delivering the truck outside the JNJ building because it's waiting for certain workload to be completed, mm -hmm. right? So um, our business is a lot more critical. Uh, we have like really critical uh, pipelines running and, um, and then we're ensuring that, that we meet this SLS. Yeah, and, and it makes a ton of sense how critical that is to your organization. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you started talking a little bit about it, but I'd love to dive deeper into, you know, I guess you think about the business impact from these data pipelines not running uh, well in your company. Like, what are some of those examples of downstream issues that you've experienced before? Obviously, a ton of criticality in, in an organization like Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, some of the downstream that we have faced it, and and there are a lot of um, we do APIs based access also, right? So the lot of data that we uh, provide in our downstream application on the API based uh, system, and uh, we have seen that um, the scenarios like actually we had recently a couple of weeks back where we were not able to complete the pipeline on time, right? Um, I don't want to go that technical, like we have a bunch of spark jobs running, right? Um, and those those has to be finished with 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 the given time zone. And then if we are having some kind of 
load issues or uh, any other um, data engineering issues like okay if some logic has been changed or the data has been changed and the data quality that changed data data quality is not there the same workload that used to run fine yesterday today is failing I means when then we are struggling to find out oh why this workload is failing it was working fine and the business will come to us business oh we haven't made any changes it's been working fine I means you guys were delivering yesterday why not today um and um and you will see that and that's where we all data engineers sit together and started scratching my head what happened um yep you know, so you talk about the data engineering team in there, like who are the other stakeholders who are involved in that conversation, right? There's so many different people who have their uh, hands involved and, you know, like have opinions, but also you know, like recognize the criticality of these issues. Like, so who, who else touches that process and you know, who else do you actually end up interacting with? So the way we have the process defined is uh, definitely we have our um, platform engineers, which we call it, um, not the core infrastructure engineer, just the platform engineer who's uh, who's basically responsible for uh, workload optimization perspective, right? Making sure that we have enough compute, enough resources on the platform, uh, enough configuration. But then we have our business partner and the data engineers who who are the uh, basically uh, sit with our business partner, ensuring that that business process is being translated into that pipeline, right? The pipeline is properly built. If there's any challenge in the pipeline, that's where the data engineers comes in, right? So they sit very close with our business and the business partner, ensuring that they understand the business, what the business is looking for, uh, so they can translate that into a proper pipeline so that we meet SLA. Um, uh, so business analyst to the data engineer to the platform engineer these kind of stack we have built to ensure that we we meet our sls um that's there are a couple of loop the couple of things that we can improve it like but but they are there are still challenges there are still challenges when the issue comes in right but there's criticality to the to you being able to collaborate with them and having visibility on the pipeline and understanding all these things for these multiple different stakeholders um, oh yeah definitely yeah mm -hmm. And I, Karan, I guess, you know, similar for you, obviously, as you talked about, you know, easy posts and, you know, obviously how core these things are uh, for you, you know, what, what are some of the business impacts that you've, you know, you've experienced along the yeah. way as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, the, the big one is, you know, we have these partner relationships essentially, right. With carriers and with third party partners uh, and maintaining that relationship is core to our, to our, the fundamentals of our business. So, you know, if the report is delayed for a week or the report is inaccurate that, you know, re reduces their trust in our platform as a whole. And so it's sort of our trust as a whole, as a platform is kind of an, on our, on our shoulders, um, if you will, as well as, you know, making sure that we make the revenue that we need to for the next month. Right. right. Um, so there's a lot, there's a whole bunch of month end processes that we support for our finance team and different stakeholder groups. So those, those are there. There's also, you know, SLAs around a lot of that stuff that we've tried to define as much as possible. Um, you know, some of it's undefined in, in that, you know, there's a sort of a handwritten agreement, if you will. It's not really something legally binding, although we are starting to get more and more legally binding SLAs. And so that is another, uh, you know, we could lose that contract if that SLA isn't met. Um, so so as, as we've matured as an organization, I guess we've gotten more, we recognize the value of actually defining the SLA and then um, you know, understanding sort of what our what our requirements are there, um, but we have you know from an organizational perspective, um, we have internal users that depend on these reports every day to do their jobs. Uh, we want to make sure that they're as as you know empowered to be productive members of our sales team, our CSM team, our uh, revenue ops team, our marketing team as much as possible. Um, Additionally, you know, we've got, um, you know, uh, an internal on-call team. Um, so if there's actually errors that pop up, um, you know, in the middle of the night or where the data load goes bad, you know, there's a team that's alerted and they're, uh, they're, it's their responsibility that rotates weekly to sort of go in and debug. Um, so that's kind of how we've organized it. Um, from, a, from an organizational requirements gathering perspective, you know, product plays a big role. But yeah, we, having data engineers actually involved and having... Uh, I, I would say even like in individual engineering teams, as we've moved towards an event stream mm -hmm. Kafka model um, for, for a lot of this data, um, having engineers that are 
Um, also, you know, well versed in exactly what the goal of the data analytics team is and knowing what types of events they should be pushing onto the Kafka stream has been a huge help in, in terms of not having, you know, uh, us be the bottleneck for those data, uh, that data to start flowing. Um, to, to, to further downstream data warehouse processing. Um, the more our engineering teams are aware of the types of challenges that we try to solve in the data realm, um, the, the easier it is for them to help, the more, you know, they have more boots on the ground knowledge at the end of the day on how their application works. Um, so having them as partners in this whole process of breaking down those data silos and aggregating it all into a data warehouse has been uh, organizationally a really big help to us. Yeah, and I'm sure it's important for them as well because they'd like to focus on other things as well, you know, yeah. and so so much of it ends up being this triage. And so, you know, say more about how you think about, you know, the evolution of self-serve analytics and sort of democratizing that yeah. data function so that all the, the stakeholders you just spoke about can, you know, interact more, you know, uh, more directly into these systems. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we've, we've had... Um... We've had a querying uh, ability for our engineering team, and then now we've started to open that up to uh, more of our business team. So we have a business analytics team um, that sort of serves as the liaison between the data team and then the business units. Um, so they they have the ability to work in Tableau and build dashboards and put together um, you know specific BI implementations or specific query uh, implementations as needed. Um, but they'll, you know, we also have a data request process that I think has really helped us kind of funnel those requests that are coming in either to that business analytics team or to us. Um, and then, so that's sort of, you know, we allow the business analytics team to sort of help the business side of the organization self-serve as much as possible. Um, from an engineering self-serve, you know, the, the engineering teams often, um, have had issues with where, you know, on their end, they may not have optimally designed databases for large queries or analytical queries, right? They're mostly focused on that OLTP structure. Um, so, you know, I've, in, in my conversations with engineers more and more, they're really finding the value of the data warehouse and being able to now, you know, aggregate across like, large, large tables that we have in our production infrastructure and be able to dig in and dive in without having to worry too much about performance impacts or other um, concerns. So. Um, as we sort of, as the data warehouse has gotten more robust, the engineers have also seen a value add in, in sort of the self-serve portion of it. Um, and we hope that, that that'll continue to grow. Is uh, It's still early stages for the engineering team, I think. Uh, yeah. they, they they have more of a day-to-day -day boots in the ground uh, concern. Um, but as they've started, you know, working on more projects, more complex projects, I think the data warehouse has become help, helpful for them as well. Yeah. And so I guess, you know, heading in that same direction as we think about self-serve and, um, you know, all of these challenges within an organization, um, you know, like what, what are the tools that are that are coming uh, into the fold that you think about that help you to solve all of these challenges to hopefully, you know, bring your, um, you know, your organization, you know, into that leading edge where you can make, bring all these things to fruition? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the, the the data governance lineage and kind of documentation piece is the big one that we've, you um, we've started focusing on over the last year or two. Um, you know, we, we, it started with a Google sheet really of just like our Google doc rather of like every table that we have in our data warehouse kind of walking through it. What are the source? What are the, what are the columns? Um, and as we've sort of uh, improved, we're, we're constantly looking at tools to optimize and improve that system. Um, beyond that, it's also, you know, obviously our BI tool. So we use Tableau for BI um, at the moment. Um, so sort of looking at how we can streamline that process of, um, e e ETL into the data warehouse, and then from the data warehouse, take specific views and turn them into, into um, Tableau data sets and then build dashboards on top of them as kind of the pipeline that we have today. Um, so that's that's sort of the main few that we've done. We're, we're always looking for new tools in the lineage and, and, and uh, validation space as well as in other areas. We've, we've written a lot of our own validators right now, um, but I think there's uh, room for us to grow in, in that space as well as to validate our data better. Yeah, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and for shot, maybe maybe over to you. You know, following you know that that similar chain around uh, thinking about self serve analytics within your organization. You know, obviously hearing what Quran you know has, has walked through. You know, similarities within your organization, and and maybe talk through a couple of the solutions that um, you you've looked at to potentially solve these challenges. Right, definitely. So yeah, as Quran said there, right? So the 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 challenge that we all face, right, means for us, the biggest challenge was the observability, right? How, and we can proactively look into that before something happens, right? Because if you think about the kind of workload we are running, the pipeline we are running it, like it, it's, 
with so many complex systems involved into that as like we have a um, consumption from the tableau to the spot fire to the click words like they're consuming the data we are integrating with multiple system from erp any erp system you can talk about we connect with the erp system and then we are also using a lot of uh, data engineering tools uh, in order to 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 process the data curation of the data so this end to end the whole end to end process requires um, a kind of uh, observability where we are failing, right? It means any of these tools that uh, can help us to understand that what are my failure points um, and during this whole to end process, that's 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 utmost critical for us. So what we did it, yeah, I means we do have some um, tools that come with the technologies like um, I mean, we were using a uh, big data platform uh, from Cloud Era, they comes with their own tool but they all siloed into their own technology, right? They are not looking what's happening on the left or what's happening on the right side, right? So um, so having this kind of critical workload running, we needed to see end to end. So we looked into, I mean, definitely we, um, um, in the data ops conference, uh, we, we actually adopted Unravel to, from the observability perspective, from data ops perspective, so that we can automate some of those processes, right? We if we can look before something that happening means we can uh, definitely help to reduce, keep the water resiliency high, right? So um, definitely a couple of tools that we looked into, um, like Unravel is definitely help us uh, a lot on the on, on the observability perspective. And from the demand from our management, right? I mean, they want to see the observability. They want to know that as, as a leader, if you are managing such platform, you should have the visibility where where the failure can happen. So yeah, means these tools are helping a lot. Um, means we have also integrated some of our um, additional tools within the J&J from the observability perspective, but um, um, we did unravel, helped us. And then also we did one more thing, um, call a failure means in, if you are in the in the quality industry that, that we did the FMEA architecture where we did the failure point analysis. Uh, every time when we come to this critical situation, we want to make sure that we can go and 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 analyze all the failure points. Right? Um, it might be something that's not happening in the current pipeline or wherever you're looking into, but it might be affecting IAM security. Like if IAM is the issue, like IDMS is having to Active Directory is not uh, not integrating properly. You might be the um, failures are happening there, but which is not big data platform, but this is something that failure is causing your pipeline to fail, right? So the failure point analysis was one of the key uh, tools that we also use to keeping this uh, platform as a high SLS. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, you know, Karan, back to you, just thinking more about those data ops solutions that exist out there and potential, you know, critical blind spots that you have or, you know, missing integrations within your stack. Um, you know, what are some other tools that you've maybe looked at in and across that space to, to gain that observability that you're looking for? And then even, you know, thinking about how you remediate these, these issues longer term. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the questions that we have a lot of times, at least in an, or in, at least in an organization, we've been um, upgrading our data pipelines, if you will, quite frequently. And so, you know, we want to see what lineage of the data in the past is being used potentially still to answer questions who do we need to migrate over a lot of this is stuff that we've had to do ad hoc here and there as we've had you know breaking changes go out and so you know i've looked at some data lineage tools that are looking at who's accessing which data sets that type of stuff as well a little bit um we're starting to dig into that a little we haven't really made any big purchasing decisions at the moment um around that space so you know i haven't really been looking at it from a from a purchasing perspective just yet but that's another area a whole i guess if you will that we We've been sort of looking to fill with a tool or a solution um, potentially um, would, would, where we could start to see um, you know as we release new data sets making sure that, that they're being adopted by the by the, the, the people that need to adopt them and what queries might still be re, be written against those old data sets that need to be migrated over yeah and and is automation becoming more important for you like as some of these things go beyond you know the human scale some things are just manually yeah. you can't keep up with how do you think about automation yeah, alerting is a big thing that we do. So we, we sort of have two um, types of alerting that we do. And I think it's been helpful to sort of think about it differently. Is one is, you know, at a regular frequency, we alert on, um, uh, I guess, you know, I guess flaws in the data, if you will. Like, so, you know, hey, there's a missing service level that's not mapped to something. And then there's only a few dozen events a day. So we don't really prioritize 
our work on fixing those problems. But if you know some new carrier releases something and all of a sudden we have thousands and thousands of events that are of unmapped service levels, now we know we have to go dig into that. So that's something that happens weekly or daily or whatever. Um, but additionally, there's sort of those, um, uh, I guess, on each load or, or if you will, at, at, at a sort of more proactive uh, alerting. Um, you know, we, we also have that sort of alert where it's like, hey, you know, these last few batches have had lots of missing events or have had events where we haven't had this data. Um, maybe you need to go look at some uh, sort of regression in the source data or, you know, some some uh, issue with some logic in, in the ETL itself or whatever. Those are sort of more proactive, I guess, if you will. So we have ones that we track over time and then we have ones that sort of alert us proactively. Right. And, and so how clear is that workflow? I, oh, well, Prashant, feel free to jump in if you have no, no, comments there. I would just um, second on Karan's right. The alerting was more, one of the most important things we wanted that to do that because uh, the pipelines and those um, um, those uh, queues that we build, right, means if something is going slow, uh, if, if the queue is filling up, we wanted to get the alert, right? So making sure that uh, the queue is properly running and, and that's automation was was actually we did a lot of automation in the last couple of years but it's still we have not there where we we want to be um when we, we are still i think we long way to go to get that uh, fully intelligent automation that where well where, where the system has started fixing by itself right um giving the giving your suggestions oh here is what you need to fix it we still go fix it but i wanted to some more like okay go go ahead and fix this uh, by itself right self-healing kind of uh, tool. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and do you feel like you have a clear workflow today and an understanding of whose responsibility it is for, for fixing these issues? <laughs> yeah. I think Curtis money. You can go ahead, Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the the common problem that the data engineer feels is not my problem. You know, some, the ball gets tossed to someone else's court. I think that's something that uh, organizationally is starting to improve in that, um, you know, there's a self uh uh, importance being placed on the data analytics. I think a lot of that has come from the business, honestly, is we, we've, one of the sort of less than ideal strategies that we took was we allowed the business team to directly interact with some engineers on some of these problems of data quality. And they realized, you know, from that process, how important the data was to the day-to-day -day operations. And that mm -hmm. allowed us to then, you know, start pr prioritize improving the data quality across those teams um, so that, you know, they had a, a visibility into what the end result was of the data uh, and they could then justify, you know, hey, you know, I, we have 350 different, you know, specifically technical problems we want to solve. But there's a you know, few dozen data problems that we need to solve that could give us a huge win. Um, you know, they, they've sort of been able to make that decision a little bit more with having more visibility. Um, but, yeah, I, from, a, from a responsibility perspective, um, the chain, you know, there is a sort of chain of command, if you will, that where we, from the business, it flows through to the, to the, to the, to the engineering teams. And I think, and then the, the, that's where we need the observability. Uh, if, because what happens is, as you mentioned, like people will start seeing it, whose fault is that, right? Is it something from the platform infrastructure or it's, it's a data quality or is a data pipeline. But if we don't have the visibility and observability built on the system, then we will be struggling on this workflow. We will be pointing finger to each other. Oh, this is data engineer will say it's not my problem; it's something else problem. So, I think um, I am um, at this point. I can say that the observability is one of the what most important for us in order to 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 make sure that this process is working fine, so that we can fix it at the right time with the right resources. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we all struggle around that. Yeah, and it's something I constantly hear from the, the board level as well, um, where as companies become more data driven, it's critical, right? These are numbers that, you know, people are making decisions, um, you know, for the future of their organization. And, you know, if there are issues, you know, down downstream, right, through the pipeline, um, you know, and the broader organization doesn't know about it, right? It's, you know, it's, um, you know, like that can change the tra trajectory of a business. And because it's so critical, you're right, there's a lot of you know, finger pointing that may end up at the at the end of the day, but today there isn't. There's a lack of that observability, so that you don't know exactly where the issues are a lot of the time, which creates yeah. a lot of these challenges. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, recognizing, you know, I, I think we're coming up on uh, on time at this point. You know, any any final comments just around you know um, sort of the, the next evolution of of data ops and you know things that you're you're looking forward to. 
Yeah, I, th- I think for me, at least uh, in the last four four plus years that I've now been doing this from the data specific space, I'm, I'm really excited at the proliferation of the tools. Um, I think, you know, the, the key thing as an engine, as someone looking to implement these is to think about the solution holistically. Don't just dive onto a, into a tool and just go into and just a tool. Think about how they're trying to solve those problems holistically. Um, and then you can go and pick and choose the tools as needed to solve the solution based on, you know, what is most important to you. Um, but I think there's so, so many tools out there now um, that, you know, uh, we where we had to build a lot of that ourselves. Now there's a lot of tools that are available to do that for you. So I'm excited for the next generation to sort of be able to adopt it and, and, and uh, leverage those, those tools in the future. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so, always the, the common pattern we see. It's that, you know, the, the companies that are at the leading edge of, of technology build these things internally and then hopefully they become democratized as, yeah. you know, more people have those problems longer term, which we obviously believe will, you know, be every organization will become a data organization longer term. So, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Prashant. No, I was saying the same thing. Um, means automation means I think that that we we do need from the set ops, I mean, tools from the much more more automation, like self-healing, self-root cause analysis. These are the things that I'm looking forward in the next level of the tools. And hopefully it's, it's coming in this in this industry. Great. Um, well, well, thank you here. both. Yeah, I grab it. <laughs> thank exactly. You. Well, thank you. Thank you both uh, for participating and, and awesome to, to chat with you through, you know, stack resiliency and, uh, you know, uh, appreciate the time and uh, look forward to chatting some more. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.